I really enjoy these sorts of videos. The ones where I don't have to just talk about the thoughts and ideas of what could happen, but I can also visualize them and share them as very legitimate renders, ones that we could believe are highly plausible. At a very recent Only Watch event, Tudor unveiled an entirely new piece and at the same time answered a question that we had all been asking. Will we ever see the big block chronograph make a return? And one thing that's so important to remember about modern watch releases, if a brand debuts a concept, a prototype, a one-off in precious metal, it's going to be out in steel soon enough. And I'll take some time to explain why in the video. But being your resident designer, I've put together what we are likely to see produced. Very believable designs that have the potential of looking truly exquisite. But the return of this watch might not all be sunshine and rainbows, which is what we're also going to discuss. So let's have some fun and unpack this watch a little bit more. Let's start with a few questions. How often is it that Tudor unveils a new property? Once every two, three years maybe? How often has that unveiling had Black Bay somewhere in the title? Well, I'm here to tell you that this is not going to be one of them. In fact, it's going to be a new model line and it's going to be a faithful callback to a historic piece of theirs, a really cool piece from the 1970s. And if we know anything, Tudor watches of the 1970s, they were on another level. It's always interesting seeing how the 70s approach has influenced so many brands in the modern setting. How this genre of styling is becoming more and more popular. Some digging deep to produce, let's be honest, more desirable Genta-inspired integrated bracelet sports watches with varying degrees of success. Others creating one-to-one -one replicas of past examples and some stretching out further and borrowing bits and pieces from other brands and making amalgamations of sorts. I think it's safe to say we've reached quite a strange time in our day and age where we have lots of examples that pull from the 40s and the 50s, but many more that are looking to the 70s and the 80s for inspiration. We have a Blade Runner-esque aesthetic flowing through a lot of designs. These kinds of neo-retro revivals. Now what we've seen from Tudor since their re-emergence from the ashes is quite interesting. Most of us would agree that some of their best, some of their most risk-taking, daring work was produced in those early years. Examples like the Advisor, an alarm watch like their original from the 1950s. Basically Tudor's answer to the JLC Memovox. Now so many details and intricacies to this piece and many would argue that it should make a return. Me as well. The North Flag, a watch that actually debuted their first official in-house caliber, which was quite a nice bit of trivia. And it had a power reserve, superb spot colors, and a story that tied it to the North Greenland expedition. Of course, this has now been taken over by the Tudor Ranger. And then there was the Heritage Chronograph. How can we forget about these two pieces? Ones that were inspired by original examples in their catalogs of the 70s, nicknamed the Home Plate and the Monte Carlo in enthusiast circles. Turns out that these were original designs from some of their earliest chronographs, bearing in mind that the Rolex Daytona of the 1970s wasn't exactly hot. So these Tudor pieces, they really brought in the funk, for better or for worse. And the result? It's almost as if the Rolex Daytona had a love child with the, the Explorer 2 1655 of the era. Orange spot colors, blends of grays, blues, blacks, whites. These really are a feast for the eyes. And also about as 70s as it gets. Such bold and innovative palettes, unique designs, ones that we would never expect to see today. It's just so far out there. I mean, they even put a Cyclops lens at the six o'clock position on these dials, because why not? It just looks so cool. Now, naturally, these are polarizing designs, and Tudor recreating these pieces in the 2010s attracted a certain kind of customer. And I guess it's also in the name, because Heritage Chronograph doesn't really mean much. But as Tudor would later find out down the years, labeling anything with Black Bay, brought in a different kind of audience. We could see this both as positive and detrimental because now the brand is in a position to make thousands of different variations under this name, the very popular Black Bay chronograph included. But then I have to ask at what cost? The cost of originality. When a brand becomes defined by one name and one name only, well, it's not as advantageous as we would think in the long run. And it's clear that in order to produce favorable watches, there have to be sacrifices in other areas, one of them being uniqueness. The choice of using monotone colors, a safe build, not deviating from that 1950s styling. Always having a triangle at the 12 o'clock position, round hour markers on the dial. You catch my drift. The sort of repetition gets tiring for a lot of folks, and I think Tudor as a brand themselves are starting to feel the fatigue. 
Now, around 1975, Tudor produced what is now commonly nicknamed as the Big Block Chronograph, but its more official name was the Prince Oyster Date. We should bear in mind that Tudor loved using the name Prince in their naming structure back in the day. But why was it called the Big Block? Well, it's because it was the first Tudor chronograph to house an automatic caliber, a Valjou movement, if I remember. And it was encased in a, you guessed it, big block of steel. Even in the mid-1970s, slab-style cases existed. And we can immediately notice a difference between these pieces compared to the earlier home plate and the Monte Carlo, toning back on the colors, opting for simple panda and reverse panda styles. Also notice how the sub-registers were oriented at the 12, 9 and 6 with a date at the 3. Something we saw more of as watches transitioned into the 1980s and I would imagine that was just because of the nature of the Valjou movement. There was also an interesting marketing campaign surrounding Tudor watches of the 70s because they had phased out the Rose logo, adopted the Shield logo. So in some of these vintage adverts you would see the big block advertised with the script, a watch cradled in armor. Quite a nice touch, I like it. Anyway, only watch 2023 we saw Tudor share quite an unusual block of gold. A new watch eerily resembling the 1970s Prince Oyster Date chronograph. But there is more cool stuff to it because under the hood, a new Tudor caliber. A prototype that's no longer a Breitling unit but something in-house that Tudor cooked up. But the interesting thing, zooming into the text at the base of the dial. Prince chronograph. Does it mean that this unit is just going to be a one-off, that the Prince Chronograph is merely an example? Not at all. And why would a manufacturer share a prototype or premiere a model in this material? Because gold is both soft and malleable. And when you're testing out entirely new tooling, which is what they have been doing, with a new case, a new bracelet, all the new fittings, you want to make your life easier by using a softer metal. So the result is that this watch is not merely just a one-off for only watch. This is in fact a proof of concept. And with that, we can now very easily predict what we are going to see next. I've been pretty safe with the guesses here, using the Panda and Reverse Panda Black Bay Chronograph for a bit of guidance. But we can see how stunning these new Prince Chronographs will be. A big red line of text at the base of the dial, a small red accent on the tip of the chronograph's seconds hand, silver subdials for the Reverse Panda option, black subdials with a possible silver sunburst dial for the white dial variant. And matching the date window with the dial, Maybe that's too generous. Must say, what I really like about this case are the square crown guards that really give it that blocked out presence of a vintage model. Other great things to mention, the screw down crowns will probably mean that its water resistance rating will go up to something like 200 meters. We can see now with the slow development of the clasp integration, we're going to see a T-fit system included in these pieces. The loom on these dials will be sparse though, judging by the applied hour markers. But I think as a complete package, far more original looking than the Black Bay Chronograph. And an even closer to the representation of a watch like the Daytona 6263, or commonly known as the Big Red. I think at this time, with the increased popularity of the Daytona and their new 1-2 variants just being a year or so old, an updated Tudor chronograph that gives you bang per buck with a similar, if not a bit more original design aesthetic, it's the way they're going to go. It's a no-brainer. And I think overall, it's a very believable concept that this design is strong, the timing is just right. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. There are definitely two areas of concern. First, it's Tudor's new MT-59, whatever they're going to call it, caliber. The first time they're using this. No longer will it be the tried and true Breitling unit. Now using three subdials for the first time in their modern collection. And this could mean, like many other new calibers we've seen released by Kinesi in the past, there could be a few teething issues. Literally. The movement's accuracy might not be up to standard, but more importantly, the caliber itself is going to then inform the design and where everything is going to go on these new watches. And then that trickles down to its size, 42 millimeters in diameter minimum judging by the placement of the date window relative to the subdials and the applied elements. So this will not be a svelte 39mm watch. Not everyone will be disappointed in that, but something to bear in mind. It'll be at least 41 to 42 millimeters. And on top of that, judging by its overall thickness when we look at the case flanks, this watch could measure at least 14 millimeters thick. Again, owing to the size of the caliber and how they're stacking this unit inside the case. So it's going to be a big block for sure, true to its name. The great stuff to come out of this watch is that it's a new property, it's original, it's far more unique and more exciting than a Black Bay. The case with these square crown guards gives me a bit of hope that we might see something like a Submariner hybrid from Tudor in the future. The overall arrangement of the subdials, the placement of the date window, the aesthetic that looks eerily like early big block chronographs. 
Personally, I think it'll be a great addition to the collection and something more akin to the daring nature of Tudor in the mid 2010s. Designs that are based off the success of the Big Brother, but are also entirely unique to Tudor as a brand. I think it's something that the name has been missing for quite a while in their catalog. Now by no means is this design groundbreaking. I'm not here to tell you that this is gonna change the world of chronographs. What I am saying is that it's deviating away from the typical structure we commonly see. By producing a design that is safe, yes, but also one that has some gravitas and some presence. I reckon these Prince chronographs are going to look great on the wrist, and whether this happens now or a year from now, these watches will be released eventually. So the upcoming Prince chronograph, do you reckon it's a watch that's going to appeal to a lot of people? If this piece was released, what do you think the repercussions would be? Would the Black Bay chronograph cease to be interesting? Would people gravitate more to these? It was a lot of fun putting these renders and these ideas together. So thank you for taking the time to watch this video. See you in the next one.